Hello everybody and welcome to the third and final webinar as part of our April webinar series. You've heard from Christopher Nordstrom and he was talking to you about Kanban and Lego. Uh, yesterday we heard from Marit Puyarvi she's, and she was talking about mob testing and today we're joined by Karen Johnson who will talk to you about uh, how manual testers can help with automation efforts. And if you have any questions for Karen, um, please type your questions into your control panel there. And at the end of the webinar, we'll go through these questions one by one. And don't forget, you can type them at any point during the course of the webinar. So now let me hand you over to today's presenter, Karen. Hi, Karen. Good morning. How are you doing today? Yeah, we're all good here. Great. We're all set. Can you see my screen? We can indeed. All right, good to go. So the reason I wanted to focus on this topic was because it's a topic that's been coming up at conferences, um, this feeling that a lot of manual testers are anxious about their jobs or a little unsure about test automation, maybe it's not in their background, not something they feel skilled at, and they're hearing more and more from teams that you know they want to get to 100% automation, which we all know is bit much, but um, I think it's an important topic to talk sometimes not just about the work that we do directly, but sometimes some of the noise or some of the issues around it, and that was why I wanted to talk on this topic, because I know it's a concern to a lot of people. Um, I won't digress for long, and I definitely want to get to a place where we can look at questions. Um, so let's get started. I have a habit of including kind of the abstract for a talk before I give it because it's sort of my bill of goods of what I promised I would talk about and that's here. Um, short introduction on me, you can probably find out more from me on my website. Uh, given that my name is kind of generic, um, I put my middle initial in a lot of things. Other than that, there's no real obsession on my middle name. Um, it's Nicole. Um, what else can I tell you? I speak at a lot of conferences. Probably most of the people tuned into this have heard me speak somewhere before. Um, like other conference presentations, I actually have tweets that are already scheduled and will be going out while I'm doing this. Um, one thing that's unusual is usually when I present at a conference, my slides are a little bit more picture heavy because I just you know like to talk to them and prefer to have my slides probably something more interesting to look at. This slide deck is very text heavy. Um, my feeling with webinars is people go back to them at some later point. They feel like, you know, if they're not able to listen to the whole recording, it's great if they can kind of flip through and see what I had to say. So, very heavy, heavy text slides on this one. So. Okay, so what I really want to talk about is how manual testers can help. And when I watch both at client sites and I talk to people at conferences and colleagues of mine, there seems to be this divide in the road where people are either manual testers or they're automated testers and they feel lost. A lot of manual testers are not sure what to do and with the growing pressure for more and more automation with continuous integration, continuous deployment, manual testers can really feel a little bit lost and actually sometimes the efforts are really kept separately where there'll be literally a test automation, you know, quote unquote engineer, and there'll be manual testers, and sometimes they don't even collaborate all that closely on their work, which I think is unfortunate. So really distinctly thinking about being a manual tester and watching kind of activities that take place on teams, I wanted to try to give the most tangible advice I could give. And I think the first thing, and I had to go backwards myself, I had to go backwards and realize, instead of being obsessed with automation as this sort of distinct thing, I think we have to think about why we're automating. And I think there's different reasons for different people. I think, frankly, a lot of executives like to automate because they feel it will go faster, it will potentially be cheaper, um, they'll feel more sure about what's covered every single time because it will just be played over and over again. Um, I think as a lot of people know, a lot of executives sort of get sold on tools. They think it's just that easy, you buy it, you install it, and somehow test automation gets you know, magically written and stays fresh and current, which we all know is, is not really the case. But when you're working with executives who think that, 
you have to find a way to get them to understand the, the drawbacks, the reality of what it really takes to get it up and running, which is quite a lot of effort. Um, but I think for manual testers, I think we have to think about, like, so why are we doing this? Beyond, beyond executives maybe wanting us to do it or teams swinging a pendulum from no automation at all to we're trying to get to 100% automation, I think what we have to realize is now we are often shipping so much faster than we ever used to. And the time to market is, is just, you know, everything's quick, quick. So when you have a large regret, regression suite and you're trying to cover that and go through everything, you know, quote everything, in a sprint, it's not really doable. And like we all know that. In a in a typical two week sprint, you know, if you're getting code pretty late into say the second week of it, you're just not going to be able to go through the whole suite. So the only way to really get there is to lean down what you're going to try to do manually, be very tactical about what you need to regression test, and look to automation to cover some of, as they call it, the heavy lifting. So I think we have to think of automation as part of a solution to a bigger problem, which is you know, the sense of speed and the sense of limited time, and trying to be in a lot of places at once. And if we don't think of automation as trying to replace manual testers, and we think of it as just a tool and a solution that the team's trying to use, we might feel a little less threatened by it. And we might think about ways that we can actually be advocates for it and help to make it happen. And I think when it comes to automation, for people from afar, whether it's executives or sometimes even product owners just really don't understand automation, I think for most of us, we just have to be really patient and try to teach them slowly you know, that you're not going to get to 100% automation, that there's always going to be need for some manual testing, that having a set of human eyes on things is so important. Um, and that automation, while it will run over and over again, it will exactly run over and over only what you've coded, and there's so much more to see. There's nuances in every release that goes out, how it's integrating with another team's software, all of these things to think about. And so I think we have to remember it's a solution. It's not a replacement of us. And then I think the next thing that we can really do is think about how you can contribute to automation. So. For me, I guess when I'm doing a lot of deep thinking, I try to get somewhere alone and probably sit with a big piece of paper and, and pen and kind of close my eyes and think about what the things are that I could automate that would speed up things in my day. And I think one of the mistakes a lot of us make, and it's understandable, is we think of automation is automating something that we manually do with a system in order to get testing accomplished, you know, allegedly faster. And it doesn't have to be just that. It could be that we're automating things that get an environment set up or getting data set up or configuration things that we need to do that are really grueling and really time consuming. And you know, frankly, they're, they're probably fairly boring things to do. And we should think about that. So even if you're not going to be the one to write automation, thinking about things that can be automated that really speed up the overall process is important. This is especially even more important when sometimes you'll see at a company where they'll have an automation team and they'll kind of come around, they'll come around in cycles and they'll automate things for your team. That person really never gets to know the heartache of what you're doing every day and what takes so much time. So being able to really contribute ideas and, and getting them to understand what would really help you, what would really help your team is a, is a big part of it. So just even contributing ideas can also make it seem like you're not separate from the automation, you're trying to actually sort of pair with the automation. Could be really helpful. And the other thing is offer to run the automation suite. I think when you're the one who actually runs it and you see some of the headaches and like what falls down and you're able to see the nuances to what it takes to get automation running, you kind of pick up more appreciation for what the test automation folks are dealing with. Um, and it also, there's a circle that happens. The more you get to know the tool, 
the more you understand what it can and cannot do, what its limitations are, the better you can offer ideas for what can be automated. So I've seen manual testers, and I'm raising my hand over here, like I've done this too, where I'll have an idea about something that can be automated, and you get in, you really get to understand the tool better, and you realize for assorted reasons, maybe the tool can't do that. And so you thought you had a good idea, but now that you understand the tool even better, you realize, well, we might have to alter that idea a little bit, or it might not really be the way you would go about it. And I think that happens in automation a lot. So the more you can see the way the scripts run, get involved in the automation in some way, the more your ideas are actually really helpful and things that can actually be done. And, and the next that I would recommend is review the test automation, which this can be hard to inject yourself into this. So, you know, you're a manual tester, you're seen as not really understanding automation. There could again be that separate test automation person doing it, and you offer to review the scripts. You might get pushback, hey, you don't even understand the tool or you don't know how to code. But my feeling on that is read it anyway. Not only go through and, and watch a demo and see the scripts that have been built, but ask if you can actually read it. And I'm convinced that over time, you learn a little bit more each time, and it gets less foreign to you, and you get more comfortable with it. And your attitude is really seen as somebody who's helping to make the whole effort of automation happen. And I think a place a manual tester doesn't want to be today is somebody who's sort of seen as anti-automation or not helping with the automation efforts and continuing and persisting to say all the testing has to be done manually or this giant regression suite has to be done manually. And so if you review the test automation scripts, even if you're somebody who can't critique code or you might not be able to say, hey, this function could be written a little tighter or a little bit better, you'll still be able to see things. It's hard to know what you'll see, but you might see a missed validation step or you might, um, you might see a more efficient way of doing things. And you might find, again, that the ideas you had in the beginning don't really play out the way you thought they would. I'll give an example. The last time I was very closely working with automation, probably like a lot of people, I thought, well, why don't we do A, B, and C? It's sort of a workflow. You know, we'll, we'll do a search, we'll find a result set, and we'll do this activity with it. And I didn't really understand why our test automation person wasn't kind of building it that way until we sat down and got closer to the code, closer to looking at the tool, and I found out just to really flip from one page or one view, it was mobile, to the next was so time consuming and so slow from a performance of the, not performance of the app, but performance of the tool, just to move from page to page to page was so slow that it made you want to think automation in a different way. Like what are all the things I want to verify while I'm on this page? Which is very different from how you would actually test something if you were going about doing manual testing. And I think you pick up on that when you get closer to see the scripts and realize how the tool actually works. And again, it makes you, your ideas for contribution for what could be automated next may change. Um, and makes you much more a part of the automation. And yes, hidden agenda along the way, maybe you'll actually realize, you know what, I might be able to do some of this automation and try to find a way in that you, you could pick up and potentially do it which goes to this next one. Um, the Cucumber tool has been really popular in the last few years, and it's funny because I mostly work in the Midwest, in the States, and we are so not like California. Um, California was ahead in Agile and has been using all these tools for a long time and probably perplexed by why some of us are still talking about these things, but. A lot of the Midwest region has actually been transitioning to Agile in just the last few years. Like the transition is still kind of a hot thing, which feels like it's done and over in other places in the world. And the Cucumber tool has often been used as a great tool for a number of reasons. One is that you can really separate what's known as like the English 
highly readable test scripts from the code. And it's true, the code can be buried in like a step definition file, which probably contains like the quote unquote scary things manual testers would think of, while the given when then scripts are very English readable, they're very friendly. Um, and you don't necessarily have to know any code in order to write in given when then. The only thing you do need to realize is that certain phrases, certain keywords that you're using are actually going to call code. So you do have to become very, I use the word persnickety, about making sure you have the exact wording and work closely with the person who's doing sort of the coding part of it. And so it takes, this takes a little bit of peering, a little bit of shift in mentality, but I did this personally. So I have often worked as a manual tester. I don't have a CS degree. I don't have coding in my background. Every bit of coding that I've come to learn has been kind of the grueling path on my own learning. I'm not good at test automation. I never let people hire me for automation because it's not what I'm strong at. And I did this personally myself. So not talking about somebody I hired and they did it. I learned given when then and I wrote the scripts in Cucumber um, and GWT and paired closely with the developer who wrote the step definitions for me and came to realize a lot of the little sort of glitchy spots together that we needed to figure out so that he could keep building functions, I could keep writing scripts, and it, it meaning the automation ethic, could still keep going forward and we could kind of both work on it, you know, intermittently as we needed to. And I just, I couldn't stress this enough to a manual tester that even if your team isn't using Cucumber, getting to read and given one then is still a great way to start to try to understand code because it goes step by step. It is so very logical. Um, if you've ever learned SQL, one of the reasons I like SQL so much is it's so logical. You know, there's, there's less, um, less room for interpretation, less about subjective kind of viewpoints. It just, it, it kind of just is. And learning given one then is, I think, a good way to start to even understand how code itself is built. So I highly recommend doing that. There's a lot of free resources out there. It's so easy to go to Google and just go out and, and find things on it. Um, I'm not even going to list things. It's, it's just really easy to go out and find it. I think the twist in the road gets to be when you start to try to implement it to your own environment. That's when you start to get into, oh, I have multiple givens. How do I deal with that? There might be multiple whens. How do I deal with that? All the examples that you probably stumble into, you know, readily on the internet, they're all going to be fairly simple examples, and it's going to start to get a little, little trickier when you get into your particulars. But again, I would highly recommend it. Um, and the scary part, probably the part manual testers are saying, "Oh gosh, I hope she doesn't say like go learn how to read code." But you know, it's good for you. Um, reading some amount of code will get you to realize other things that could be tested, other things that should be tested, and could put you in a place where you can recommend to developers unit tests that get built. So you could start to push some of the testing upstream even earlier, and it will change your point of view. It will move you from being a black box tester who doesn't really understand how the code's written and you're really dependent on the user interface to see what the results are, to being able to anticipate ahead of time the kinds of things that could go wrong, the kinds of things that you could test, um, and give better recommendations. And it will even help you all the way back at the very front when you're getting into figuring out a new feature and the product owner's there, and maybe you're in product envisioning sessions, it will help you to realize some of the questions that you want to ask early on because it will help you to see some of the ways that things can go wrong. And as a tester, manual or automated, anytime you can learn something to figure out more ways to break code has got to be a good thing. So if it can improve your manual testing, why wouldn't you do it? Because in an environment where there's more automation going on, the one thing, and I, I say this at conferences all the time, if you're going to be a manual tester going forward, then you're going to be darn good at it. 
And so if you're going to be a rock star manual tester, you've got to come up with as many, I don't know if I want to use the word tricks, but as many, you know, as many insights or as many tools or as many ideas you can have for how to go about doing testing, how to go about really at the end of the day providing value to your team. So sometimes we provide the most value by just asking questions at the very beginning of product envisioning and not even waiting until we get our hands on code to try something out and see if we can break it. We might as well just ask those questions up in the beginning and see if we can even prevent some of the bugs from the very start. So those are some of the ideas that I have on um, how to help. Um, and I'm hoping that they're really tactical things that people can go ahead and do and, and try to find yourself like in a place where you're not seen as the manual tester who's anti-automation, but instead maybe you're the manual tester who's still trying to make it happen, still trying to figure out a way to help the team. I think that's a better way to look at it. Um, in the second half of this presentation, I wanted to talk about some of the roadblocks to automation. And honestly, this is not to be a downer and talk about all the negative things, but more from the mindset of if we look at some of the things that sort of mess up downstream, that go wrong later in the game, as it were, then maybe we can prevent some of those things in the beginning. And so talking about some of the things that often go wrong in automation, I think is more about, so how, how does my team not do that? How do I avoid that? How can I recognize this is where other people have, have kind of fallen down and how do I prevent my team from going down some of the same, you know, kind of potholes? Um, so I want to go through some of those. And I think one of the first is, I think automation sometimes lacks a strategy. Uh, in the olden days, which would be maybe 10 years ago, we used to write test strategies and maybe a test plan for a release and we had time to plan things ahead of time. We were often you know, in long product discussions. We didn't get code for a long time, so the best we could do was sort of write a test plan in deep anticipation of what was coming and be ready for it the best we could. And so we had time to come up with a strategy. And now what I find is that writing a test strategy is like some bygone thing. Nobody ever mentions that anymore. And even test plans, like it just doesn't really happen. What happens now is this sprint planning, and we know what stories are going in, and hopefully we're looking at our regression suite and we're thinking, well, for this particular sprint, I'm going to add these tests, and I'm going to exclude these, and I'm going to add these. And it's a sort of ever morphing thing to think about the regression suite. But I think when it comes to automation, I think we need a strategy. It doesn't mean it needs to be an old-fashioned, like really heavy, long-winded document that has to be you know, circulated around and approved. But it does mean we need to come up with a game plan. And I think a lot of times it's such a headache. It's so much work to get the budget approved, to get a person in place or multiple testers in place to do automation that by the time we get all that, we're just really anxious to get going. And then we have all this other pressure around us from the teams, we're like, oh, well, you know, when are the first groups going to be ready? When, when can we integrate that? That I think it's just too easy to just jump in and get going. And I think we can jump in and we can get going on things. We could even work on a strategy in parallel to sort of starting the efforts. But I think having a sense of what we really want to do is an important thing and being able to think about it very succinctly. So imagine, you know, you finally got the approval for a tool and you're walking down the hall at work and some executive who approved the tool says to you very quickly and off the cuff, hey, so what are you guys going to do with that tool? What's like, what's it, what's it doing for me, right? Because this is their investment and they want to know how it's going to pay out. Being able to answer that in a really short way is a good thing because it makes you realize in very short terms, what it is your goal is to do with the tool. Is it to replace some of the manual testing and regression? Is it to get configuration stuff up and out of the way? Is it, is it some opportunity to test something and 
pair it with you know data files so that you can try things with lots of different you know products or lots of different customer configurations. What is it like? What's what is the short answer to that? And knowing that would be really helpful. And I think the next thing is you know a lot of times I think they're just it just lacks support automation. I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody kind of sitting in a corner or even offshore or remote writing automation and no one asked to see it. It's a terrible thing that happens where all these automation scripts are getting written. The team doesn't sit through them and, and know what gets written. It becomes this unwieldy suite of like, oh, yeah, 700 regression tests. That's fabulous. Do you know what they do? Half the time the people don't know what they do. So I think it's a matter of keeping like keeping your team involved. So if this was potentially the same group of people who were really hot to get automation brought in to your team, finding some way to keep them engaged in what's being automated is really important. It affects what the developers will be unit testing. Um, it affects their sense of how important it is to keep the regression suite up to speed. It, it gets everybody involved in it and it can even ripple back to the, again, like kind of the whole circle, of even back to the beginning of the product envisioning sessions where early on people are talking about what they want to automate, what they can automate, how they're going to test something. And I think we need to be the advocates for that. And I think ironically the manual testers can be the most like sponsors of the automation because they can be advocating for it. And you know part of it is demo the automation that got built this sprint. Talk about it, you know, in the demos for automation scripts that were updated, automated stuff that was added, and have it be considered part of the product. What's painful is when product owners don't have any involvement in automation. So for them, it's all overhead, it's all extra, and they don't want to invest in it. And so automation falls to the product backlog, and over time, automation becomes practically defunct. So the best way to keep that from happening is to get them excited and keep them involved in automation. And that takes an ongoing, you have to be thinking about it all the time, not just once in a while. Um, this next slide, this happens a lot too, where the regression suite takes too long. I see this pendulum swing from we don't have any automation, we're hot to do automation, we get a tool in, all of a sudden, you know, the next thing we know, it's 700 tests, tests have been automated. Now the regression suite takes too long. There's grumbling about running it. Things fail. I don't know why it fails. It's just, it's a headache. So it sort of gets pushed aside because, because the suite takes too long. It's no longer the help to the team. It's now the handicap to the team. And now we go back to doing all manual testing again, and it's this really most unfortunate situation. Um, I think it's even worse to have a team that, I'd rather have a team that has no automation and is still painting through manual testing and has to become smart and tactical about what they're doing than a team that brought in automation, has this huge suite that they can't run in anymore because it's so big that it's painful. Um, and they're doing manual testing too. It's it's the worst of combinations. So, you know, come up with a lean regression suite, one that's actually runnable. And I think from a couple of people now at conferences, I've heard this concept of rotating the other, sort of the other automation tests so that they've been run recently, but they're not always run on every sprint. And so you end up keeping those automation scripts stay up to date too, because it's not as if they haven't been run. And a great time to do that might be at the start of the sprint when testing you know, still goes through sometimes this awkward, we don't have anything yet, we don't, we don't quite have the code, we can't quite build the automation yet because maybe some things don't exist yet. It's such a perfect time to go back through and make sure our automation scripts that already exist are still working. Um, so try to figure out a, a way to run them intermittently. There's another whole scenario that happens out there, and I've seen this a number of times, where automation will be run as a separate team. And I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad 
it, it all depends on how well it gets executed as opposed to one way being the right way. Um, you know, it's great when the test automation person is embedded in the team. They have a sense of what the team pains over. They know the things that are time consuming. They have great insight into how the automation tool is really going to help the team. But sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes it's an automation person who they're almost on a rotation where they're going to come in and quote, you know, help your team with automation and then they sort of disappear again because they're helping the next team. And I think what happens in these situations is the teams really just don't end up feeling like they own it. I think one of the worst situations I saw was at a client a couple of years ago where the automation was being built um, by offshore testers and every now and then, so it would be just a few times a year, they, they, the offshore testers, would do an automation demo. And literally, early in the morning, they would invite people to come in, and they would let the automation scripts run with no dialogue, no understanding of like, OK, so I'm going to run this next script, and it accomplishes this. And we built it for this reason. They would just let the scripts run. Pretty much everyone in the room was bored, because at some point, it's just stuff running by on the screen. You don't really know why. The checkpoints, the verification points, really not all that obvious. Um, whether it was working as it was supposed to or not, also completely not obvious. And it just made the automation this add-on. It's like we were supposed to feel like we had the gift of automation, but it was hard to receive the gift, and nobody in the team really felt like they owned it. And the thing that I saw is so wasteful is knowing that there were real people spending all of their days automating stuff that no one else really cared about, and it wasn't really factored into the regression very much at all, it just seems so wasteful, not just of money, but of just human effort um, going by and it, it not really doing anything. So I think if you end up in a situation where, for whatever reason, the automation engineer is not part of your team, finding some way that they can attend meetings or somebody in the team really kind of takes it and owns it and bringing it in so that automation doesn't feel like it's tacked on at the end is, is important. And I'm kind of a classic one, and this has gone on for years, where if the automation is really dependent on the UI, it ends up breaking because things change. Um, it's just a reality. You know, trying to build automation that's is, you know, with the least amount of dependency on the UI as possible and thinking ahead of time about how to go through and build scripts that are not going to be frail. Um, I have two people who kind of previewed my slides today, and I want to thank both of them. One is Amanda Smith, and the other is Shelley Wagner. And I think Shelley had mentioned something to me about, wouldn't it be interesting if you used a manual tester and had the manual tester be the one to kind of keep an eye on when the UI changes and help to make sure the automation scripts are brought up to date. And that is a great idea. It's a great way to get a manual tester thinking about automation because as they see you know, new things changing in the UI, they'll be a lot more aware of scripts that might need to be updated. Um, taking a peek at questions because I want to make sure that uh, leave time for questions. I'm really curious to hear what people might want to talk about. Um, trying to be a little ironic here, I guess, about you know that thing when scripts fail and they never get updated because it's such a hassle. And I think this goes back to having an automation strategy. I think we need to figure out, are, are our automation, it's like a mouthful to say first thing in the morning, are automation scripts worth updating? Or are they kind of lean and scrappy scripts that, you know, when they break, we're just going to build a new one and it's okay. Or we don't have to worry so much about the UI. We don't have to worry so much about, you know, things changing. We're just going to build fresh. And I think a lot of it has to do with figuring out a strategy to begin with and understanding the tool that we're using and what the labor is. Because this is trade-off and, you know, scrapping a script, but then there's a trade-off in also maintaining a script. And I think the worst is just having scripts fail and nobody bothering to take the labor to go back and find out what's gone wrong with it and what do we need to do to fix it. Um, so I, 
I think, you know, deciding to decide. So deciding, here's a script, it did something good for us, but it's time to get rid of it. It doesn't work anymore, and that's okay, and we're throwing it away, is very empowering. I think ending up with a large suite where half of it doesn't work is really not only um, ineffective, but to some degree demoralizing. So get rid of it if it doesn't work. Okay, so I want to open up the floor to questions. Uh, I want to say just a couple of things, though. Again, I made the slide deck so you very much will be able to kind of grab it and go through and read it. Um, I included resources that I'm not going to post up on a screen here, but just some bits on automation that I think are, that are out there and interesting. I know a couple of my references are old, and you know what is shocking? how little some things have changed. Things like manual testers feeling displaced by automation or coming up with a strategy for what you want to do with an automation tool. I made sure. I went through every reference that's on this list, which it's not a long list, to be honest. Okay, Karen, thank you very much for that. Um, let me just open up my screen here again very briefly before we, we go through the questions. and. I just have one or two little things I want to go through myself. Thanks. Okay, I hope you all can see my screen there now. Um, Karen is going to be presenting at the Eurostar conference this year. She will be doing a tutorial on uh, solving problems in your workplace. And if you'd like to find out how you can register for this tutorial, head over to the Eurostar website. And next month we have another webinar as well taking place. This time it's with Jeff Thompson. And we have a few more names to be added to the list. And so if you head over to Test Huddle, you can register for this one. The conference, as I mentioned, is live. And from now up until the end of May, you can get a 15% discount on your registration. We also have a software testing event taking place next week in Warsaw called the Eurostar Roadshow. It's our very first ever Roadshow. We're very excited. And we have some great speakers lined up there, some former program chairs, um, a lot of other tutorial speakers from Eurostar. And if you'd like to find out a bit more about that, just head to the Eurostar website. And there's a discount code there in the bottom for 10% off your ticket. So let's have um, a look and see what questions have come through here now, Karen. And the first question that I see here is saying, um, I'm a manual tester. My manager asked me to write automation scripts. Studying a program language takes a lot of time. What can I do to make this process easy? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I think when I was trying to learn a programming language, I went to like back to the very beginning and started with like a 101 tutorial, and I was studying at night and trying to learn. And I think if I had to go back over that process now, I think what I would do instead is come up with your own curriculum of the things that you want to learn, and recognize you're probably not going to suddenly learn all about programming and coding, and if you take a look at things, you might realize, oh, I need to learn how to write a function. So let me just focus on that as opposed to feeling like you have to learn everything. Um, the other thing you could do is, as you come up with a curriculum, it could be that you go to one of your developers and you say, you know, some things I don't know how to do yet. And if I batch them up in a certain way, can you help me, you know, do these things until I get to a place where I can learn that? Um, I think just instead of trying to do everything, I think just come up with a succinct list of the things that you want to go after and you know start start basic and just kind of go from there. Great. Um, the next question here, it's it's kind of a long question, so if you need me to repeat, um, I will indeed. And this question here is asking, um, since we are doing behavior-driven development, our developers automate the feature files. However, the tests are fragile due to various malpractices followed. What is your suggestion to get over the issue? Perhaps hire an automation engineer? And also note, our testing staff is focused on exploratory testing only. Hmm. It's a good <laughs> question. Um, I think 
the answer that I would give to that is probably not the answer you might expect, which is I am a really big fan of asking teams to do whole team regression testing, at least for like one, two, three sprints, so that everybody in the team starts to see the headache of the regression suite and helps to figure out what they can do to streamline it, what they can do to make it easier. I think this is a case where you should probably do more demos of the automation so that the developers can see the things that are going kind of wrong um, and, and can like help chip away and work in it. I think until they feel the pain, they're probably going to just kind of keep doing what they're doing. And I'm getting the sense that if they're building things that are not done in a helpful way for the testers, then they're not engaged in it in some way. And it's something that they must, they must be feeling like they have to do it as opposed to seeing how it really helps the team. So I would get them a little bit more involved, see if you can um, get demos of the automation uh, in your team demos, and see if you can do whole team regression testing a couple of times so that they can see what the problems are themselves. Okay. And the, I can the, see the questions and going ahead, which is really great. Thanks. Another one of the attendees here is saying, um, I'm a little bit confused about how you write automation scripts with the lowest amount of dependency on UI. Trying to learn automation, so perhaps this is a very basic question there. This is what they're saying. I think it's a perfectly fine question, and I don't think you should ever, um, ever feel bad about asking a basic question. Um, so lowest dependency on the UI would be, you know, if you need to verify that you're on a certain screen, or your, lo you know, your automation tool is located on a certain field, trying to make it so that you kind of reference the page or reference the field um, through IDs uh, that are not sprinkled, as it were, throughout your automation scripts, but are in one resource file so that you can update that one resource file will make some of the changes to the UI a little bit easier. Um, and also just to ask yourself, like, do you really need that verification step? Is there any way that you can work around it? There's this um, concept in mobile testing that I have a colleague named Julian Hardy. Um, I, I like the term he used about headless, headless mobile testing with automation where you're not depending on, at all on the UI. You're actually going through the back end and you're not trying to write automation as if you're kind of a ghost user um, using the product. You're actually going right at the code and you're not at all dependent on the UI. In order to do that, you've got to really be pretty skilled at the programming. So if you're not at that, then the best you could do is make sure if things in the UI change that it's again not you know, sprinkled throughout lots of scripts where the upkeep is going to be really hard. Okay. And another question is asking, what is the best strategy for automation? I think every time I get asked the word strategy, I think the word risk instantly pops into my mind. And the first thing I think about is, what do you want to do with this tool? What is it helping you to safeguard? Is it to make sure certain core things about the product are always working? And if that's true, what are those things? And it's almost like you have to step away from the product that you're testing and really think at a much higher, more meta level and realize, you know, maybe it's a search tool and so getting the right results set back is actually the most important thing. And so maybe what we could do is build some smaller set of data that really challenges certain conditions all the time to make sure that, you know, both the data set contains what it should and doesn't contain what it should not. So um, I think it's about figuring out what you really want to get out of the tool and not being distracted by other things that you could do with the tool. Another question here. Actually, I think this question is aimed more to so at me, Karen, than it is at you. They're asking, is this webinar recorded? Uh, yes, indeed it is. All of our webinars recorded, and also you'll get access to the, the slides in there too for those of you who are asking. Um, but that's enough from me. Uh, back over to Karen. Um, the next question I have here is asking, uh, 
what is your experience of getting development teams who are used to working with manual testers to adapt to working with automation testers? I've known them to feel quite challenged. I've also known them to work with the automation testers and start to ignore the manual tests. And mm -hmm. given what then is the language that any tester can write, is that good? <laughs> Not sure if you got uh, that. Yeah, I think I've got that. So we try to break this into pieces. So if the dev team starts to work with automation testers, they are probably going to be able to more readily relate to the automation testers because the automation testers are probably talking in code. So they're in, you know, they're on familiar home turf. And so then the manual testers could really feel left out. I get that. I understand that scenario and that's probably really frustrating. I think the best thing a manual tester could do in that situation is really start to show the value of exploratory testing and also show the value of, you know, there's some things that we want to test, but it's not really going to make sense to go through the time labor to automate these certain activities. And so I am going to be the one who's going to go through and do those things. And so getting the developers to realize what it is you're doing you almost have to advocate for your own job so that they know you're still doing good things. Like, you know, this feature is being, you know, covered between unit tests and test automation, but I'm going to go through and do the integration testing when our team's stuff works with another team's stuff to make sure that this still works and so that they understand what it is that you're doing and what it is you might still need from them. So it might be that they feel like the manual testers are off doing like they often don't know. So part of why I suggest doing whole team regression testing is a lot of times the developers find out what the testers are doing because other than finding bugs, a lot of times they don't know what the testers are doing. So you ignore people when you don't know what it is that they're doing. So, you know, work on making sure that they see a value. I'm going to move on to the given one then. It's a pseudo language. Is it a good place to start? I think it's a good place to start. Um, Bright test is GWT rather than this classic manual steps. Well, the reason why I like given one then, not only is it directly used by the Cucumber tool, but it's usually a faster way for manual testers to start thinking in those small, discrete, logical steps, which is really how code is written. Um, I know as a manual tester myself, I tend to think about what logic is it that I'm trying to break. You know, this product is supposed to do X, can I get the product to do Y? You know, and I'm trying to find ways to twist it. Well, when you work in given one then, it starts to get you to think in code-like terms. So, you know, given really makes you realize what all the assumptions are to begin with. Um, and what, like, the known state or what are the givens? And all of a sudden you start to realize that there may be a lot of assumptions in that. So I, I think even if you're working in another language, starting to break it into those small pieces could be helpful. All right. I think I've covered that, I hope. Yeah, I think I think I was confusing there before, um, Karen. I was starting one question and morphing on into the next question without a break in the middle. So, apologies for that. <laughs> um, the next question I have here is saying, is asking, um, uh, we want to try to put automation testers into our definition of done for stories, but there's a natural fear that we simply won't have time and stories will drag on to the next sprint. Any advice on this? I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's. Um, I think it sounds good. I think it's the kind of thing that you would put in a definition of done, so that you feel good. Like, a, you know, automated testing has been created. Um, but I just, you know, again, this goal of 100% automation doesn't make sense. Some things are never going to make sense to automate. So if you put it in your definition of done there's inherently going to be times when that won't be done. And so now you're going to get to a place where that part of your definition of done will get skipped. So if it gets skipped, like, do you stop kind of using your definition of done? And now your definition of done doesn't really have a meaning to it. So if a whole team is looking to do that, I think the better way to word it in your definition of done might be that we've considered testing 
and that we will address it through either manual or automated testing on a story-by-story -story basis might be, you know, and that language needs to be cleaned up a little bit, but might be better than over-committing that you're going to automate everything. Okay, lots of questions are in now, so. Yeah, sure, and um, we'll have a look at the top one here that's asking, um, what do you think could face, uh, sorry, how do you think we could face dependencies of different tools in case of low documentation, for example, spec flow and uh, spectrum in, uh, is great, but configuring it is hard due to few documentation. I'm not even um, I'm not even familiar with this, but I think you know, like a deep sigh because I was originally a tech writer. I think there's a there's a lot of um, very lean documentation these days, as in there isn't any, and you have to figure it out for yourself, and that's probably a shame. I guess the only thing I would do is look to see, like on LinkedIn, if there's an automation community that might be using that tool, or if it's you know open source stuff, trying to find you know like-minded people there and and seeing if you can figure out your way. The other, you know, the other thing is there's nothing wrong with going, going to the developers and saying, you know, I'm trying to get this automation tool up and running and we need a kickstart, which I think is something that should probably be planned on when a tool comes in. The overhead of getting going on a tool is shockingly high. Um, so ask, you know, ask other people for help and you know, probably stop looking for documentation because it probably doesn't exist. So. Okay. Yeah. Just so the listening realize, it's a lot to try to like read ahead to questions and answer them at the same time. So. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot Please. of questions there, and, th and thank you all for for throwing them out to us. And let me see. oh, I was asked this the other day. Do you mind if I read this? Sure, you fire ahead. Okay. On what basis? Oh, I, I think it's missing a couple of words because they probably wrote it really quick, but on what basis is an automation tool selected and what language is best used for scripting? I'm going to break it into two parts. So the advice I gave to somebody is the, um, the, auto, the best way to pick an automation tool is to make sure you have somebody who's going to use the tool. So you could go out and do this lovely you know, analysis of all the tools that are on the market, figure out the tool that's going to fit in your environment, and then find out you've got nobody in-house willing to adopt the tool. Um, so the best tool is when you have somebody who will actually work with it. Um, and I don't think you should worry about what language is best used for scripting. It is so hard to say based on what the product is that you're testing. So there's a lot of marketing hype around tools that are out there. And I think trying to come up with, like, maybe do a small proof of concept. and Probably no matter what tool you pick, you're going to find it doesn't do something that you wish it did. And either you're going to have to extend it or get your developers to help you extend it, or you're going to have to live with like the limitations of the tool. And once you figure out the limitations of a tool, that's when you should really adjust mentally what your automation strategy is. Because you're going to start to realize what you can and cannot do, which you know sometimes is really disappointing, right? So, okay. Um, while you're reading there, Karen, I'll jump in with another question here. Um, someone has here, and they're asking, um, they mentioned, you mentioned earlier um, the risk for automation, and they're asking, what can we do to reduce the risk? Don't let it die. I think, you know, the worst is when you buy a tool, or even if it's open source, and you go through all the, you know, internal, you know, and you finally get everyone on, on board with using a tool, and then for some reason it just, it just dies. Um, most of the time, for clients that I've worked with, it dies when somebody leaves the job. They go to another team or they leave the company. They were the advocate for the tool, and it just dies. And it gets to a place where it's so old, nobody wants to bother. And then somebody else comes in, and they get excited because it's you know six months, a year later, there's another tool, and it starts all over again. Um, so don't let it die. There's a question here from another one of our Eurostar speakers for 2016, 
Uh, it's Richard Bradshaw. Thanks for coming along, Richard. And yeah. he, he's just asking here, um, when should we start thinking about automation, the pre-planning, planning, and once tested? Yeah, I'm really glad Richard is here, too. Actually, I've recommended um, him in my resources. Following him on Twitter has been great. Um, you know, I think thinking about automation from the get-go is important, but I think a lot of times it really comes down to people. It literally, you get down into a small scrum team and you're talking about, you know, literally a handful of people. If you don't have somebody who's going to be an advocate for the tool, like you're kind of going nowhere. Um, so I think it depends on who you have literally on the team. Um, if you've got a centralized automation group, then it's a matter of figuring out how much time are they going to give you on their rotation. Um, when should we start thinking about automation? So from the very beginning, but it depends really on what you have for people. During planning, I'd love to hear automation planned on every story. I, I wish that was, you know, something that people just talked about. Like it should be part of the checklist for every story. Like are we automating this? If we are, who is? What's covered in unit tests? What do we want to do for manual testing ahead of time? Um, I think I've covered that. Yeah, I'd say there might just be time for one more question, Karen, and we're okay. almost out of time there. So if you want to, if there's anyone in particular you want to address, if there's any one of those questions there you think might be ben more beneficial to the, the listeners? Yeah, I think this other question from Richard is a good one, and I know from being at a conference with him, he is also a big advocate of automation doesn't have to just mimic user behavior. Automation can do all sorts of things. It could be, you know, write a utility for something, you know, get data set up for something, get a configuration set up for something. It's thinking about an automation tool, I think, in a different way. So do I encourage the use beyond simple tests? Definitely. Um, I think any way an automation tool can help you get through your sprint then the tool is doing something, and I think that's what counts. All right, um, we'll, we'll leave it at that for today. We're out of time. Um, thank you again to, to Karen for today's webinar. It was really entertaining, and thank you all for coming along. And there's, there's loads of questions. I, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Can't get through them all. Um, but we appreciate you, you coming along. And, Make sure you check out the Test Huddle website to see what other webinars we have coming up next month. Um, I, I know we've got some more speakers coming in in the next couple of days, so make sure you check that out and see what we have lined up for you. That's it from us. Take care, everybody. Thanks.